and I'm also going to All right, so I am sharing the uh, YouTube screen. And the first that I want to talk about is uh, Thought Emporium. So Thought Emporium is uh, this crazy guy. He's living in Ottawa, Canada, and he has a biology background. So you can see he does like uh, genetically manipulating yeast into uh, being glow in the dark. He has uh, modified his own DNA for, or uh, modified DNA uh, to sort of change his butt, gut, gut biome and, and do some other things. It was, was controversial, but he goes through um, lots of other things. What I'm going to show you right now is just an example of something that I want to do at Make Haven, which is to create a uh, fake leather from kombucha. And so, uh, that's what this this video is about, and I'll just play it. We're going to play a short segment. Um, Uh, Jay, are we supposed to be seeing something? You're not seeing something. I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. You are supposed to be seeing something. Uh, you're supposed to be seeing a presentation with audio. Uh, let me just reshare it. Can you confirm that you're seeing something? Yeah, now we can. All right. I don't know what I did there, and I apologize for the dead time. <laughs> um, I'm gonna go ahead and just... ...pans, we filled them with freshly brewed tea, leaving about an inch of space at the top. For the bins, we filled them with about four inches deep of tea. Kombucha is an aerobic culture, which means it needs oxygen to survive. So for the bins, we left the lid on enough to cover it, but still allow for air. For the hotel pans, we put a sheet of glass on top and added four skewers as spacers to allow for airflow. Once everything is cooled to room temperature, we can add a small amount of liquid from store-bought kombucha. This will be our starter culture, and a SCOBY will start to form after a few days. Some people will suggest that you need a piece of SCOBY to start a batch of kombucha, but that isn't true. The SCOBY is part of the life cycle of kombucha and will form on its own. And now, all that's left to do is wait. The longer you wait, the thicker the SCOBY will become. When we dry the SCOBY later, it'll shrink in size significantly, so we need to allow it to grow to at least 1 to 2 centimeters thick, which will take 2 to 4 weeks. As it grows, the bacteria will deplete the nutrients in the liquid, so you may need to add fresh, cooled sugar tea. We normally can get at least one good SCOBY from a batch of tea, so you'll usually only need to top up the liquid after harvesting a SCOBY. After the incubation period, it's time to remove the SCOBY from the bat. When it's fresh, it's very slippery, so be careful not to drop and damage it. Before we can treat it and turn it into leather, we first need to dry it. We've tried two similar methods for this, and are still perfecting this technique. In both attempts, we made a frame out of wood which we could lay the scoby across. It's then sandwiched in place with either another identical frame, or some extra pieces of wood. The fastest way to remove most of the moisture is to leave the drying scoby in the sun for a few hours, but placed in front of a fan for a few days also works well. When it's freshly dried, it feels a lot like parchment and it loses a lot of its flexibility and becomes far more brittle. Obviously, this is nothing like leather, so we need to... Uh, so there's uh, there's more to this. So you guys got... The, first of all, you saw the video and you heard the audio, right? Good. Good. Thank you. Um, so there's a lot more to that, uh, but I think it's it's a really just that's an interesting teaser as to gives you an idea of how somebody can kind of use those culinary skills and uh, and get into that. Um, 
I am going to go to Steven. So Steven, do you want to introduce the uh, the Winter Garden video that you submitted? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Wintergatan is, uh, I think they're Swedish. Uh, they're a band that does um, just really kind of out there stuff. Um, and uh, probably about four years ago, one of their members built uh, a, an automated music machine that uses 2000 uh, ball bearings or marbles to play the music. He just starts cranking and they start going through. And uh, so that's the clip that I gave to JR. But in the intervening years, um, the guy's just been going nuts uh, with all sorts of making to come up with 2.0, uh, which would be something that involves metal and can be taken apart and taken on tour with the band and it can be um, programmed to play different songs because the original version just plays the one song. And so uh, every Wednesday or so he posts, you know, progress reports. And I think the most recent one uh, built a new bass with like metal channels to make sure that the marbles are always hitting the strings at the right angles. Um, there's, you know, footage of the band playing it live as a four part, you know, number versus the machine but uh this is the this is the entrance to the wormhole so I'll, I'll let jr go with it now yeah excellent and and do let me know if it doesn't pop up correctly okay <laughs> forward just a little bit since I want to kind of keep it to the two minutes. I think there's the finale. Something that I've seen before. I'll love to see some of the other, uh, the other things that he's got uh, going. Maybe that's a, a future, a future share. Um, so I have, uh, I have another one to to do. Uh, this one is uh, he kind of is like a, like a PBS sort of guy. Uh, he gives like the history of technology. 
And uh, I've enjoyed a lot of his uh, presentations. This one in particular is about injection molding. And injection molding is something that we've wanted to do uh, at Makehaven. And it's, a, it's something you can do to do mass production. Uh, so let, with no further ado, I'm going to share the engineering guy. Before the mid 20th century, injection molding machines used only external heating of the barrel to melt the plastic before a plunger injected the molten material. But because plastic conducts heat poorly, the temperature was uneven in the barrel. Either the middle was too cool and not fully melted, or the outer regions were too hot and degraded the plastic. The solution was this, the reciprocating screw, often regarded as the most important contribution that revolutionized the plastics industry in the 20th century. In the earlier plunger style machines, plastic filled completely the cylindrical barrel. But as I showed you, the plastic was not at a uniform temperature. The reciprocating screw overcomes this in three ways. First, in modern units, the plastic fills only the space around the shaft of the screw. This eliminates the cooler central region, leaving a thinner, evenly heated layer of plastic. Second, the screw has flights that wrap around the shaft. As the screw rotates, the flights transport the raw material forward through the barrel. The flights also serve to mix the plastic. The screw action agitates the melting pellets within the flights to create a uniform mixture. And third, so that gives you uh, a sense of the sort of diagrams and, and history that you might get from the, the engineering guy. Uh, so I'll encourage you guys to continue watching and, and learn about the history of uh, injection molds. Um, I think next I'm going to jump over to uh, Michael. Uh, do you want to bring us into the video that you submitted, Michael? Sure, yeah. Um, it's, it's not anything really mind-blowing, but um, I've been watching hours and hours of uh, tutorials on software, because that's basically all I do all day, is play with mostly the Adobe Suite. And so the clip is um, just a portion of a video that I shared with my students on drawing faces. Um, and also, the reason I shared it is just to show um, the demos that are being aired every day by different software companies, uh, Adobe, this one's Adobe. Um, and you can pick up a lot of um, instruction just by watching like 45 minutes or an hour a day, so. Like, say I'm doing like a straight on portrait. I usually do a circle and then I do like this egg shape here. And I'm sure everyone has heard the like, draw an egg and then draw the rest of the face. And you're like, but where does the rest of the face come from? Um, I typically do this. I draw like an egg shape and then I make a new layer. I'm going to come in here with a smaller brush. Um, and what I do is I make a diamond shape um, in the middle of my face. And I don't mean diamond like this. I mean diamond like a, like a stereotypical like icon for a diamond like that. Um, and the reason why I do that is because it helps me map out what exactly I'm doing. I'm going to duplicate this and flip it just to make sure it's symmetrical, which it is not. Um, and then I'm going to show you how I apply this. That's good enough. Boom. All right. Um, if I draw a diamond and I put it right here, guess what? This is going to end up being the beginning of the bridge of my nose right here. So I'm going to just jump ahead uh, so that we see what she comes up with. Yeah, so most of the demo is actually on the only doing the armor. Uh, she just takes uh, like a quick break to do that um, to do that little portrait tutorial. So yeah, so if you back it up, yeah, right about there, so you can see. And so the alignment, very cool. Yeah. So it's just, you know, there's, I've been watching a bunch of these every day and um, all, there's a ton of free information out there right now from um, all these, uh, you know, content providers and they're just broadcasting every day. So it's pretty cool. Great. So uh, I will 
So uh, I have another one that uh, Lior had introduced me to. So there's a lot of these videos of, uh, you know, a lot of mine are engineering focused, um, but uh, this is somebody who just like is always working in his shop and kind of, oh, I guess almost like grandfatherly. Uh, and and uh, his, so his name is This Old Tony and he just cobbles things together uh, all the time. So this, I thought this was interesting. He's starting to make, he's trying to make like a band that goes around to make a round band. And he just uh, improvises a fixture. Uh, and so better to see it than to hear me explain it. Now, every other die has sort of the axis of rotation concentric with the bending face. So the round dies have the hole right in the middle. This die has its mounting hole much closer to the bending face. So if you move the blocks in, at some point they won't be able to clear the rotation. So right there, the bender is sort of jammed. It'll only go so far because sooner or later this block is gonna hit this face because it's larger than the radius. I can now slip in sort of the preform here. And just start to bump it to reduce the radius. Now I'll just keep repeating that until this circle closes. Now if I were to pull this bender until the blocks bottom out on the die all the way around, it would result in a circle of a diameter of 135 millimeters. And that's the size that I think I showed was stamped on the other side. I don't have a 200 millimeter die, so I'm just sneaking my way up to it with this. This will then need a little bit of cleanup, but we'll get to that in a minute. So that gives you uh, a little preview of, of what it looks like in uh, this old Tony's shop. Uh, so I think we can move on to the next one. Um, actually, Todd, do you want to uh, do you want to introduce your uh, the video that you submitted? Oh, you're on mute, Todd. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm interested in video and, and film. And if people, if, if anyone's on YouTube, you know that so many, the production values are going up and up and up on YouTube. And half of the vloggers these days are actually just talking about camera stuff themselves. Um, so this, there's a lot of superfluous stuff, but there's this one guy, Omar Gonzalez, who I like, who's, who has a really good attitude and he's fun and he gives some lessons about things. So I thought I would just introduce you to him if you're interested in improving your, your camera skills. Oh, oh, sorry. I will sharing right now. So the four qualities of light that I'm gonna cover are intensity of light. Number two, we're gonna talk about the color of light. Three, direction of light. And four, the quality of light. So let's, I'm here at my workbench, I got cap, I got a little light, and we're gonna just kind of show you more than tell you how light works. Let's start with the intensity of light. Okay, so for all our lighting demonstrations, we're gonna use Captain Rogers here. <laughs> and I'll be using my little desk lamp and also this uh, LED light, this bowling. We've seen this guy before, I did a video on this light. This is a really great light, it has you can do colors on this light. You can also do um, the way we're gonna use it today. We're gonna use it as an LED. But uh, this is gonna be how we demonstrate how light works. Okay, so let's start with the first property of light that we care about in photography, which is the intensity of light. This simply is how much light is hitting your subject. So let's pretend the LED light here is a flash. We could have maybe a, a large intensity of light. So maybe the flash is in full power. And a flash, if you are using a flash, you can turn the flash down 
to lower the intensity of light. So kind of like a dimmer switch. So we'll simulate that here with the LED. Maybe the flash goes from full power to maybe half power, then you do quarter power and et cetera. So these changes in intensity in your light are measured by what are called stops. And as a photographer, you should always be thinking in stops. So a stop will either double your, whoa, whoa, come back cap, clear. So a stop of light. Okay. All right, so that's that's about two minute uh, sample. You get a sense of, yeah. of what Omar Gonzalez. Omar Gonzalez. And um, I will then do, um, so I find this guy is uh, a real trip. Uh, he is, uh, I think it's Styro Pyro. Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen him. He's pretty well known on YouTube for doing uh, projects with lasers that are so dangerous that he keeps getting banned from YouTube. And then he had people had to write a petition to get him back on YouTube. Uh, uh, but he's, he's an engineer. He reminds me of my cousin who's an absolute, um, you know, crazy man, but, uh, I will, I will give you, this will give you a sense. This is a project where he is making a bug zapper into a super bug zapper, which is clearly, uh, definitely needs to be modified. So it's home. much stronger. I tore apart this bug zapper to see what I was dealing with on the inside. And taking a look at that circuit, this is essentially the same thing that you'd find inside of a camera for its uh, flash circuit. The only big difference is that this capacitor gets charged up to about 10 times higher than what you'd find in a camera. And then of course there's no uh, trigger circuit to fire a flash lamp. But essentially it takes 3 volts DC and uh, steps it up to nearly 3000 volts to charge that capacitor. But then the circuit is normally open. In fact, uh, the voltage gets applied to that inner plate there and then the two outer plates are kept at about zero zero volts. And then once a bug goes inside that grid, it connects the circuit and then that energy from the capacitor gets dumped to the bug and it allegedly explodes. Now one way that I can modify this thing is to remove that little dinky capacitor in there and replace it with some giant capacitors. Now the only issue is it would take forever to charge it up and if you touched it would kill you instantly. But in fact I have a better idea. I'm going to use this ignition coil from a car to generate those high voltages that I need. And not only because it's easy and cheap to use one of these, but also because it's a good display of electromagnetism. So if I look at the Maxwell Faraday equation, it says that a changing magnetic field induces an electric field. And now the Biot-Savart law says that the magnetic field is proportional to the current going through some wire configuration. So essentially that means that in order to generate, sure yet, but it is very, very cool. I would not want to accidentally bump into this. I play with a lot of dangerous things like high voltage, chemicals, lasers. There really aren't that many things that freak me out. But I do have a couple phobias and one of those... <laughs> so, yeah, I, uh, so that gives you a sense of, of what he does. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, not recommended for home use, uh, so do not take that as an endorsement of replication. Um, I know Colin was able to join us, and uh, you sent me a link here, Colin. Um, I'll get that queued up. Do you want to uh, introduce why you picked this link? Yeah, so that's, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of Simone Yetz, I think is how you say her last name. She makes me smile constantly. So she is basically just a maker. Um, she's more than just, she's an incredible maker. And she rose to fame because she makes something that she has coined the term of shitty robots. Um, so she's just made these robots that do absolutely nothing, but they're so awesome in how they work. So she'll do like, an alarm clock hand slapping robot where it'll like slap you in the face when you wake up, but it's made like horribly. So it like just ends up like hanging off balance and like sort of going way too fast. It's awesome. So as somebody didn't, didn't that, she have a brain tumor or something? How, did she get over that? Yeah. Yeah. She's recovered from that and she's back to making. So this is just a, kind of a cool example of her making a soup serving robot. It's actually pretty sweet. I have a servo motor recorder. I'm going to control all the servo motors and then you can like record a sequence and replay it. It has like this weird bug where I have to slam it for it to actually start. I 3D printed all these parts. 
because you can't get a claw that needs to pick up soup just like that. It'll need a little bit of fine tuning, just, just a little bit. work. Things are going to be great. Thank you for your trust in me. This especially is going to be so messy, which is nice because I have this whole crew here who can help me clean up afterwards. I'm just going to sort screws and ignore what this robot is doing. I'm like actually nervous. <laughs> hey Google, turn on the soup robot. You got it. Turning the soup robot on. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for, for sharing that one. Um, I have, um, so there's a couple that were submitted, uh, but I don't see the uh, people here. So maybe I'll save those. I have a couple more to do. Um, this one I thought was a really cool project using uh, Shapoko. Uh, so this is uh, Winston uh, Moy, uh, who's done several uh, similar projects. And uh, what he's going to do is he's using a Shapoko, which is relevant because we have a Shapoko. Uh, but he's taking out the bottom board, and he's going to carve a pumpkin. Uh, so you can see. It's time to carve. Here's where I'm not really satisfied with easel. You can't center your project at zero, zero. My first reaction with a project like this would be to move the spindle to the center of the pumpkin and start cutting. But since you have to offset everything from the origin and easel, I had to reverse offset the spindle to start. After manually moving the spindle to the highest point on my pumpkin, I shifted the spindle two inches to the shallower passes I tried again. This time, the end mill cut for the pumpkin with just the tiniest bit of deflection. When the program finished, I rinsed off the pumpkin sludge to reveal cleanly cut edges. All in all, I'd say my carving experiment was quite successful. And on that bombshell, it's time to end. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back next time. That's cool. Yeah, ever, ever since I saw that, I wanted to carve a pumpkin using the CNC machine <laughs> and get intricate about how we could do it. Um, yeah. Some Halloween, we'll, we'll we'll get there. Just something that's really obviously impossible to like do by hand. <laughs> like if it was like a a three D face carved into the side of a pumpkin, I don't know. That probably would be super hard. But yeah, uh, and so I have one from. Uh, so Adrian submitted a video. I don't see him here. Uh, but I think since uh, he hasn't shown up yet, we should go ahead and uh, share it. Uh, so I don't actually, it's uh, called Building a Turbo Engine. And that's all I know about it. So I will share that now. Especially bad meal ones. Yeah, there. Mm, just another 27 to go. Flame chew. Oh, what a fit. <laughs>
smooth like a groovy. So I don't know exactly. Uh, I don't know exactly how that ends, but uh, I think I get the I get the idea. He's similar, it seems like, to the uh, the the gentleman with the fly swatter, in that he is, uh, you know, he's on there. Um, I have a few more on the on the list that were submitted by others or identified by myself. But before, if there's anyone else that has one that uh, you would like to share, uh, you can just drop it in the comment. And uh, we'll we'll improvise it uh, improvise it in. Um, so I'll share maybe like two or three more, and then we can, you know, if people have a taste for it, we can have a discussion uh, about them or, or other things. So uh, the one that uh, I will share now is one called AVE, uh, and AV, <laughs> AVE is a character. Um, I, I'm going to play it. I don't agree with everything he says or how he says it. He's kind of a yuckster. Uh, I had to sort through a lot of videos to find one without profanity uh, for about a two minute clip. Uh, but he's another one of these people that works in a shop. Uh, so I did a little background on him. He, he's a, like a miner in Northern Canada and uh, goes out to these mine sites and has to do a lot of improvising with uh, not too many materials. There's also kind of a cultural thing with miners where they have a funny way that they talk to each other. And so he implements that accent and employs a lot of uh, funny terms uh, in the way he describes it. And so here he's taking apart something from Harbor Freight, which he calls uh, Harbor Fraught, I think. Uh, and well, so that's enough of an introduction. You have an idea of what you're, you're in for. And I will uh, pull him up now. Yeah, I feel like AVE is kind of like essential education for like engineers and stuff. The switching in this drill, and we see what they're expecting. Instead of putting a heat sink directly on these, and these two are just tiny little packages, just babies. And then they're expecting this heat to sink in to this copper layer, through the holes in the board via the vias, through this heat transfer membrane, and into the heat sink here. So here are the MOSFETs, these are what's getting hot. And over here, floating atop this membrane, is, yeah, <laughs> that's the heat sink. Um, I would say that's a fail. That's, so when you have one of these drills and it craps out, it runs, it'll run all the time. The switch suddenly, because of course, you got angry pixies coming from here, coming from the battery through here into this huge inductive load. When you shut that off, those pixies want to keep going. And that makes the voltage scoot up. That's mitigated by these two diodes here. So if, if one of these diodes is blown out, chances are, uh, very shortly thereafter, these MOSFETs are going to blow out. So if you do have these MOSFETs blown out, you're going to want to check this these diodes as well. Now we get into the brawn of the operation, the motor section and gear train. We'll pull that off. That's a permanent magnet DC motor brushed offset by 90 degrees. This is a very strange arrangement. Normally we would see four brushes there is room on this brush card for four brushes. Um, that's really quite odd. That is a cost saving feature. On the brush card here, we want to see if it's thermal plastic or thermal set plastic. Thermal set plastic will burn, not melt. And that's what we want. We're at 750 dungarees. And it is melting away, not burning. So that's probably a nylon, a P, probably a PA 6.6. .6. And some brushed, or some brass, rather, brush hole. Yeah, so 
one of the things I found really interesting from when he takes down tools is how he analyzes like the plastic. So he'll burn it and see what kind of smoke it is, see how it melts. Uh, he'll look at the mold or the, the marks from how the mold made the tool on the inside and explain uh, what the scratch marks mean or like, oh, these guys are really using this tool way past its lifetime. Uh, so it, it's he's got a lot of great insights. Uh, but you know, some of his language is not for the faint of heart. So fair warning on that, uh, on that front. Um, so he does the, have so many like good nestled between all of his sayings and profanity and stuff like that is he does have some amazing like lessons to learn too. Right. I mean, especially for people that are making things, he'll tear this stuff apart and you learn a lot because he'll he'll tell you why something doesn't work very well. So it's something that you can kind of carry into what you're designing or making so that it doesn't have some of those things. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So this one, um, I was expecting Lior to show up, but he, he's not here. Um, and he submitted this one. So I'll just uh, put it up. In this first video of what will be a multi-part series, I begin the construction of a John Wilding large wheel skeleton clock by making the frames. I'm going to model most of the parts in CAD as I go along. It should make it easier to follow what I'm doing in each video. But in this case, it also has the added benefit that I can use a printout of the model as a template to cut out the basic shape of the frame. The brass is 3 16 inch engravers brass and the glue I'm using is an oil based spray. It holds up quite well to all the handling this part gets while it's being made. Now I want the frames to be an exact match so I'm cutting out both of them at the same time using the one template. And for the time being I'm using these machinist clamps to hold them together. But ideally, I want to do away with these clamps and hold the plates together using cap screws at each of the pillar hole locations. You'll see what I mean later. Before I can deal with that though, I need a way of registering the plates together so that whenever they're pulled apart, they'll go back together in exactly the same way. And I'm going to do that with the inner surface. And then the pins were hammered in. And then 800 grit to leave a nice surface finish. In the next few videos, I'll make the pillars, washers, and screws. Thanks for watching. So that looks like a a big project to to build a uh, full clock. Um, cool. So I think this is, so I have a, a few others that I could add if people had a hunger for more, but I, uh, so Paul actually submitted three so I could, uh, play, well, well, yeah, why don't I play at least one of Paul's and then we can, um, and then we can take a break. So this one is sent by Paul and it was, uh, shows how to make an oval picture frame starting uh, from the 32nd mark. He uses three nails and some string and some math to figure out how to draw shape and size. Also great emphasis on the pattern of wood making. Um, and so I will pop that up. So, so we need half of both of those numbers. So we need four and five. Remember those numbers. From that center point, make a mark at four. Then from that four inch mark, we're going to measure five inches back to that middle line. And then another one over here. We have our three points right there, right there, right there. I'm just going to CA glue a couple little bolts on here. 
And I'm gonna go just inside my marks because I want it to fit within an eight by 10. Between our three points, we are going to tie a string and cut this extra off. And then we can also remove this one right there. So now we can take our pencil. How cool is that? It is just under eight and just under 10. We can cut this out at the band saw. I'm gonna work this out on some paper. I know that there's going to be a rabbit about a quarter of an inch on the inside. And I know I want the frame to be, oh, let's say that wide. So we want four miter pieces of wood that that oval can fit into. So let's say, drawing some miters in there will kind of give us a little rough estimate of what we need. 10 and a half by 12. Cool. I think that gives us an idea of that one. Um, you know, using the two focal points and a string to be able to get that nice oval shape. And I see that uh, Andy has provided me an additional video, so I will cue that up. And uh, Andy, do you have uh, audio? Do you want to introduce it? Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so this guy's a lithium known computer. He's, uh, he's pretty wicked. He's, uh, he just builds synthesizers, and uh, he plays a lot of music, and he's, he's a really interesting guy. I haven't actually watched this video. I, I just kind of picked one at random. Um, but uh, he's, he's hacking Furbies <laughs> to make uh, an instrument. Cool. Yeah. Bad. Souls have merely been stripped. Stripped for them. Mm -hmm. They're all mine. All mine. So after a very long day of soldering, I've managed to get two of them soldered up. As you can see, that's a lot of Arduinos, even for the portable Furby organs kind of standard. I think the other one's got 150, this one's got 42. Uh, looks pretty good though. So that's 20 Furbies worth. So now I need to go over to the Furbies, finish the wiring on them, and then kind of give it a little test before I build a lovely box for it. I bought along this thing, which is a Pearl Drum X. It needs a bit of modification. That's going to be another video coming up. But for now, it sounds like EastEnders. Oh, something smells a little burny. I'm not exactly sure what's going on. I did do a four hour live stream when this was taking its hold on some of the first. Cool. Yeah, I have not. Uh... I have not seen him before. He's another, uh, uh, he's definitely another character. Um, Did you say the name of it? It's Look Look Mom, No Computer. That's the name oh, of the Oh, Look channel. Mom, No Computer. Cool. Uh, look Mom, No Computer. Yep, Mom. Mm. Great. Oh, and, uh, and we have Lior. Lior, we already played your clock video. Uh, so I apologize. I didn't realize you'd be here. Did you want to no, say no. something about why you picked it? Uh, no, I mean, I just, I, I feel like it speaks for itself. Uh, it's like, I'm not sure how much or what of it you watched, but it's just like really great technique and really good videography and uh, really fine craftsmanship. And it's something that Colin Bunting and I connected over years ago when we first met. So that's a nice memory. Um, so yeah, great accent. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, so I have a few more we could do if people are hungry for them. Uh, but I just thought I'd take a, a pause first and 
see if you guys had any thoughts on these videos or if this sort of cued other uh, other resources in your mind. And let me know if you want to do the other ones or you feel like you've seen enough of the YouTubes. Everybody's muted. Were there were there any standouts? Yeah. So were there any standouts? I don't know. I think we're all biased. <laughs> to your own? Yeah, right. They were all. I think, I think the Kombucha one was kind of uh, disgusting, and I don't think I'll forget that. The, which one? The kombucha. I don't think I'll get uh -oh. those images out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> useless robots was definitely the most useful. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think she. I read somewhere that she just hacked a Tesla sedan into a pickup truck. Yeah. Oh, that was her. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I've seen that one. It's like a hacksaw to a brand new Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There was somebody wrote a really good profile piece on her not too long ago, and like, oh really? Know, she's been through a lot of up and downs with the brain tumor and like anxiety and everything, but she's a fascinating person. Yeah. Yeah, she's just very inspiring and she's extremely, uh, I don't know, she's just been a positive kind of influence in my life over the years. You know, even through the, the cancer thing, she's just been one of those people that is always trying to look for the good. And she makes stuff and it's usually either really cool looking or hilarious, which is an awesome combination. Great. So uh, if you guys have a hunger for it, I'll play a couple of more. Uh, Paul submitted two more, and I have like two more that I have. Um, and then we can we can call it for the night. So uh, Paul said that this is just like an excellent video on uh, and a primer for wood turning. So uh, I will uh, put that on. We'll just see a little segment of that. Just made the Rorker chair. All those can be done with a skew chisel. This is the main spindle turning tool, okay? And this is why you can do a lot with it fast. Okay, here we go. I'm going to make a quick mark. Just for my knowledge, to crank up the speed a little bit. Okay, remember, I ride the bevel, I lift up on the bevel. That bevel will always be cutting the wood. And then I can control how much wood I take off by the angle of the back, so I'll dive in. As long as that bevel stays on the wood, I have ultimate control, and I let physics handle all the effort. So here we go. work furniture makers we'll spend almost as much time finishing our projects as we do building them well in wood turning here's a quick and easy finish you can do i have beeswax and when i'm doing demonstrations a lot of times i'll pass this around and i'll ask people to figure out what it is because you smell it and you can smell the honey basically they just take honeycomb cool so that gives you a, a sense of that woodworking um that woodworking presentation and so the next one that uh, I had queued up was Cody's lab. Um, he's a chemist primarily, and he, um, but he also does a number of things that involve metallurgy or uh, building things, uh, building things after he has extracted and refined that metal or that material. So with no further avail, here's uh, Cody's lab making a uh, ring. Okay, there it is. All right, so far so good. Uh, it's gonna need a lot of clean out. And here it is. After a little bit of grinding and polishing, I think I can finally call this a ring. It's still a little rough, but I think it's quite pretty nonetheless, considering the fact that I made it myself. 
I think the gold makes for a very interesting stone. <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't get too scratched up. I mean, it is uh, the natural gold, so it's like 22 carats, so it'll be slightly harder than pure gold. Same goes for the silver. Occasion. So, if I recall correctly, he actually went out and extra found that gold on his own property out west and collected it and then extracted it from the rock and went through So there's a series of videos going through the process of uh, making that ring and building it up to that. Um, so, uh, Stephen, you have another uh, a good wood turning video. So do you want me to play it? I mean, yeah, if we got a couple minutes. This guy um, doesn't, he turns stuff, but not wood. Um, like he is just sort of an irreverent. A lot of, uh, I found him through epoxy stuff. Um, you know, like gummy bear axe handles. And um, the clip that I gave JR is a cereal, cereal bowl. Um, uh, what I really love about this guy is that he completely embraces the mistakes and, you know, builds them into the videos. And so, he walks a really fine line between incredibly polished, you know, classic high end YouTube and like, oops, um, which is completely reassuring. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll share away. You guys have been asking me to do this for a long time, and I have been telling you it is on the list. Well, today we are gonna do it. Cereal bowl made out of cereal. One of my main reasons for not doing this for so long was that I didn't think I'd get all the bubbles out of the resin just because of the amount of cereal we're gonna put in and all the air pockets we're gonna create. Now that we've got the pressure pot set up and working, if you didn't see that video, I'll put a link to it up here. I think I can finally do this project. We've got our mold, which is just a plastic bowl from the dollar store. Good amount of mold release. And we're gonna use art resin today. I think it's gonna start off. <laughs> What we're gonna do is we're gonna plop right into the pressure pot. We're gonna push all the bubbles. We're gonna make the, it's gonna work. It'll be great. Oh, this is just a chippy mess. As you cut into the cereal here, it's nice that all the cereals actually got colors all the way through. It's just really grabby. And I've had this happen before with things that I've turned when I make weird stuff. If it's just solid resin, you get these really nice, smooth shavings. But this morning at 2 a.m., I polished the outside with the highest grit of micro mesh. Yeah, I just popped awake at 2 a.m. this morning and polished a bowl out here in the shop for like an hour before work. So one of the reasons I used art resin for this is because art resin is actually a food safe resin. What does that mean? Is a dishwasher safe? Cool. I, uh, I like that one. It makes me think there's a lot of things that you could make bowls <laughs> out of. <laughs> yeah, did he do one out of uh, charcoal? I think I may have seen Yeah, that. he's done charcoal. Um, he does a lot of stuff with micarta. Um, uh, he did like crochet throwing stars with his wife a couple of weeks ago where they, uh, you know, she just sat there crocheting and then he, he resined them up and ground them down. There's a pancake Frisbee, you know, it's, it's just goofy enough, but I learned a lot more about resin and epoxy watching his stuff than pretty much anything else. And the one that I found him through was his pressure pot versus vacuum pot video, which, you know, Long story short, the pressure pot works. The vacuum pot just creates a giant foaming mess. And uh, six ounces of, of epoxy in the cup ended up with like an ounce in the cup and the rest in the, the tank because it just foamed and foamed and foamed for like six hours. So uh, I have another one. Uh, it's called Crash Course. I don't, it's pretty popular. I don't know if you guys have heard it before. Uh, but they started off with just like history and some science ones. And it was the idea of uh, like the cliff notes, basically. So you could watch uh, a course in the period of, you know, 30 minutes. Um, and so they speak fast and they move fast and they have animations, but that's expanded. And now that they have, uh, they have like business entrepreneurship, uh, they have, uh, you know, biology, chemistry, botany. Uh, and what I'm going to show you is just one segment of their whole engineering course 
Uh, and this one is about materials. Uh, so they have a whole material science section. Um, and I will share that little clip. As an engineer has thought about using it at some point. As far back as two and a half million years ago, early humans were using the materials around them, primarily stone and wood, to build tools like hammers and axes. These days, we've developed totally new materials. There's aerogel, for example, which is an ultralight substance that can withstand high temperatures, not to mention graphene, a one atom thick sheet of carbon atoms that's stronger than steel and superb at conducting heat and electricity. While those advanced materials might be more widely used in the future, Today, most materials that engineers work with can be categorized into three groups. Metals and their alloys, ceramics and glass, and polymers. Which material is best suited for a job depends on its properties and how those properties affect it in practice. More specifically, whatever we're using is vital to know the material's mechanical properties. Mechanical properties relate to how a material's shape changes when a force is applied to it. To make better sense of this, it helps to have a concrete example in mind. But we're not actually going to use concrete at least not yet. Instead, we'll consider a steel beam, like the kind widely used in civil engineering and construction. Of course, we could make beams out of all kinds of materials, and the resulting beams would have different properties. But no matter what you're making them out of, there's one important thing to know. No material is perfectly rigid. As long as you apply a large enough force... A so that gives you a little sense. Uh, maybe that clip is a little dry. Uh, but the, they bring animations and other pieces in, and they do cover great content really quickly. Uh, so I would totally recommend going and just looking through their playlists, uh, and then they'll have entire series. And the engineering one has 22-minute videos in it, something like that, so it's, it's a serious amount of content. Um, and I think that we actually have one last one that paul submitted uh and so we might as well uh check it out and so his his introduction to this is uh tamar tamara uh three by three custom his favorite maker uh she breaks down creative joint and takes viewers along the ride i love her honest approach and her failures and learning uh she embodies the maker spirit so let's see what uh, that looks like. Some joinery on Pinterest, as one does. And I came across this joint from Peter Sealand. And at first glance, I had no idea what was going on here. And it looked really intriguing to me. But then I stared at it for a few minutes. And I realized that if you break it down, it could actually be a pretty simple joint. So follow along as I try to figure it out. Widthwise. This is a little center finding square. It has two pegs. You put it around your piece and you put it on an angle so it gets the center. Put your pencil in the hole and draw a line. Now I have center marked out so that's as high as I'm going to cut. Now I'm going to use the other board as a referential. Now this goes like that. One of them goes like that. It's totally like this. Okay. There we go. <laughs> and this one goes like that. All right, now I'll just glue this little piece in. So I just sanded it up and the joints are a little bit gappy. So I'm gonna try to fill it in with some sawdust and glue. I don't have any ash dust, but I have white oak dust. We're gonna see if that's gonna be a good enough match. And after some sanding and some finish, here is the final joint. I really yeah, that's I know there's a whole world of uh, of joints, um, and so you know someday uh, I'll get into that with the hand tools. So that's our list of videos. Um, we have covered an hour, so I feel like we've and we've covered a good number of videos. Um, so I thank you for walking along with me and, and checking out what's out there. There's a lot more. So I think we could, uh, of course, do this again. Uh, and I'd love to hear other people's perspectives on various resources and videos and materials that are inspiring or informative. 
So great. If you guys have any closing thoughts um, or reflections, uh, otherwise we can, uh, you know, wrap it up. Super cool idea, JR. I'm a big fan of it. I think there's a lot of people that have, you know, there's so many little rabbit holes in YouTube and, you know, I've got like my little echo chamber of the videos that I watch, but it's so cool to see the ones that I don't that are cool. And I, I would never think to find them, but now I will. Cool. Yeah, agreed. Great. And I'll, uh, I'll publish the list on the event. So the ones uh, submitted will also make it in there, uh, submitted in the chat. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming, and have a wonderful evening. Thanks, Jar. Thanks, Jar. Thanks. Thank you.